Listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. A health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. You hear an ENT specialist talking to the father of a patient called Jack Harris. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Well, Mr. Harris, I have your son's notes here, but I'd like you to begin by telling me a bit about your son's hearing problems and what's brought you here today. Sure. Uh, well, uh, Jack's five now, and in general, he's pretty healthy. They didn't notice any problems with his hearing when he had the postnatal test, you know, the screening immediately after he was born. Yes. He did get a few minor ear infections when he was two or three, but the doctor gave him antibiotics and they soon cleared up. Mm -hmm. Oh, and uh, about a year ago when we were away on holiday, he got conjunctivitis, but that sorted itself out without too much trouble. OK, so what was the reason for Jack's original referral to ENT? Uh, well... We'd noticed for a few months that when we were talking to him, we'd get a lot of, like, what and huh? You know, basically asking for repetition, but mm. we just thought he wasn't listening. Then his grandmother noticed that if she asked him a question when she was standing behind him, he often didn't answer. And once she'd pointed it out, we noticed it was happening a lot. So, anyway, a few months ago, he had another screening test. This was at school. All the children had one. And they told us that he seemed to have a problem with his right ear, that we ought to see someone about it. I see. And is there any family history of hearing problems? Well, my hearing's OK, and so is my wife's, but my sister, that's Jack's aunt, is only 43, and she's just about totally deaf. Right. She's been like that for quite some time. Then my daughter, she's a bit older than Jack, she's had a few ear problems, middle ear infections, so she had grommets put in, mm -hmm. but... Since then, she's been fine. OK. Anyway, in the, uh, the first consultation, the doctor did a whole load of tests. She looked in Jack's ears and she said they basically looked fine. There was a bit of wax in his left ear, but it wasn't stuck to the eardrum or anything. And his right ear was completely clear. Then he had some other tests. Uh, one was a... a, a, a Tim... Uh, Tim Panagram. Uh, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Jack didn't like that because he had to sit very still. He said it made funny noises. But anyway, he was very good, and uh, the doctor said the results were fine. Then she did a test called SRT. I don't know what that stands for, but it was to test how sensitive his ears were. Mm -hmm. And this is where things got interesting, because Jack's left ear was fine. But when the doctor tested his right ear, she didn't get any response at all. I mean... <laughs> She actually went and checked her equipment because she thought it had gone wrong or something. But that wasn't it. Jack had a serious problem with the hearing in his right ear. And the doctor explained that this was probably something called auditory neuropathy. Something to do with the nerves. Yes, it means the nerve from the right ear to the brain isn't working properly. Mm, right. So that was a bit of a shock. <laughs> and we didn't know what to think at first. But... Anyway, we had another appointment with the same doctor, and she repeated the tests. Then she did another one, which she said was testing how the brainstem responded, and she said that also confirmed her diagnosis. And she said that Jack could probably manage to function okay with his left ear. 
But after we'd gone home, I thought about it a lot, and my wife and I decided we wanted to know a bit more. Extract two. You hear a rheumatologist talking to a patient called Sandra Delgado. For questions thirteen to twenty-four, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. So, Sandra, I have your notes here, and I can see that you've had a diagnosis of lupus. But perhaps you can tell me, in your own words, about your condition, when it started, the treatment you've had, how it's affected you, and so forth. Sure. Well, I've always worked, despite my illness. I studied law and worked for a law firm in my twenties before moving into human resources, which has been my field ever since, for about thirty years altogether. And in spite of my health problems, I've always tried to keep as fit as possible. I swim every day if I can. Also, even though my life isn't easy, I'm a very upbeat person, really. That's good to hear. Okay, so the first symptoms of lupus appeared in 2007. I suddenly felt very ill one evening, as though I had the worst flu ever. I went to bed, but when I woke up the next morning, my joints were all swollen and I couldn't move. My husband took me to hospital, and the doctor there thought I might have some kind of virus, and decided they needed to keep an eye on me. So I was there for three days,、mm -hmm. but when they finally let me go home, they hadn't worked out what was wrong with me. Did you ever recover from that episode? Partly, but for the next five years until two thousand and twelve, I never felt completely well.、Uh -huh. I was in a permanent state of exhaustion, really, and this started to get me down, and I ended up feeling pretty depressed. Meanwhile, I had flare-ups of pain in my joints and muscles all the time. No, but it was pretty uncomfortable. There were other things too, like night sweats. That was on pretty much a continual basis. Then、mm. I'd get splitting headaches, migraines, actually.、Mm. And another thing that bothered me was mouth ulcers, which I'd get from time to time. Okay. Apparently, all these things are common with lupus patients. That's true. Yes. What sort of treatment were you getting? I saw my GP regularly, and she tried various things with me, but nothing did much good. To be honest, she wasn't convinced I had a genuine illness because at one point she said I should consider having counselling. You know, the problems were really in my mind.、Mm. That upset me. And I wasn't prepared to go down that route. So, what happened in 2012? Well, because I was getting bad pain in my hands and wrists, my GP referred me to an arthritis clinic, and a specialist there almost immediately recognised I had lupus. You know, it was scary being told that I had a potentially very serious autoimmune disease, which there was no cure for. But it was a relief to know what I had. I was given anti-malarial medication to take, which I believe often helps lupus patients. But unfortunately, I had an allergic reaction to it. Were you given any other medication? Well, the lupus affected my cholesterol level, and I started taking statins. I also followed a dietary and exercise program the rheumatologist recommended, and it seemed to help for a while. So you had a period of remission. For a couple of years after 2014,、mm -hmm. but then the migraine came back with a vengeance,、mm. and my memory, which had always been very good, started to deteriorate. I had some tests and was told I had sticky blood. I was told to take aspirin to thin the blood, and that does seem to have worked. Yes, people with lupus often get sticky blood. I know, but other things started to go wrong. The lupus attacked my thumbs. They got very swollen to the extent that I ended up having an operation, which pretty much fixed the problem. Fortunately, and since then I only get twinges now and again in the areas that were affected. Does that bring us up to the present?、Uh, pretty much. The main problem I've had in the last few weeks has been in my hips and knees. The pain there, especially in my knees, can be excruciating.、Mm -hmm. That's why I've been referred to you now. Well, thanks very much for going through that, Mrs. Delgado. What I'd like to do now is carry out a couple of tests on you. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. 
In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. Questions 25 to 30 choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. You hear a GP talking to a patient about a gastroscopy. Now read the question. Do you have any questions about the gastroscopy? Well, I know they're not very pleasant, to say the least. This guy I know had one a while ago, and he said it was the worst thing he's ever had to go through. Oh. He was basically gagging the whole time it was going on. I'm thinking, well, it's all right to have discomfort for just the 10 minutes or however long they're doing it for. What about whether they're damaging something down there and you get other issues as a result? Oh, no. <laughs> anyway, this guy said he'd have felt better if he'd been given a general anesthetic instead of a local, but I know it's best to avoid a general if you can. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, the main thing is to find what's wrong with you and get the problem sorted. Question 26. You hear an emergency doctor talking to his team about patients who present with abdominal pain. Now read the question. One of our biggest challenges is when patients come into the emergency department with abdominal pain. This is partly because a wide range of conditions could explain it. But do bear in mind that some patients have faulty memories when it comes to procedures they've had in the past. Like, you might ask them if they've ever had any surgeries on their abdomen, and they say no. Then you look at the abdomen, and there are evident scars there. So it's crucial to get as full a picture as possible. Even though, obviously, time is of the essence with a lot of these conditions. You also need to be aware that surgical scars are getting trickier to discern with the increasing use of laparoscopic surgery. Although, as you know, one classic location is just around the umbilicus. Question 27. You hear a nurse briefing a colleague about a patient. Now read the question. Mrs. Rowan in bed fives had a total knee arthroplasty with spinal anesthesia and sedation and a left femoral nerve block. She's doing very well. She's having about two out of ten pain. Right. She has a history of some COPD. We've been getting her to cough and to use her incentive spirometer. She hasn't used one until now, so we need to urge her to keep on with that so that she doesn't develop pneumonia. Yeah. She has a Foley catheter with clear urine, and we've had 130 millilitres out of that. She's asked about going to the bathroom and when her catheter will come out. We've explained that it usually comes out the first morning after surgery, but that it depends on when the spinal block is discontinued. She was okay with that. Question 28. You hear two nurses conducting a patient handover. Now read the question. Mrs. Allison came in three days ago with congestive heart failure. She has a history of diabetes, hypertension and congestive heart failure with an irregular heartbeat. She also has a history of falls. Okay. Since admission, she's been alert and tests show that she hasn't had a heart attack. Right. Her bowel movements are normal. She ate most of her breakfast, but she's been asking if her relative can bring in some savoury snacks. She says she wants food she can taste, as she puts it. Uh, can you make it clear to her she's on a cardiac diabetic diet? Mm -hmm. Because of her multiple conditions, she would retain a lot of fluids, so we need to cut down on the sodium. 
but we can arrange for her to see the nutritionist and maybe there are more appealing healthy options she could try. Question 29. You hear a GP talking to a young mother. Now read the question. So, how can I help you? How's the baby doing? Uh, fine, I hope, Doctor. He's just seen the nurse for his vaccinations. I wasn't sure whether he should have them done or not, but she's explained to me that despite all the stuff you read in the media, they don't cause autism. There's absolutely no evidence for that. Proper scientific studies show there's no link at all. You definitely did the right thing. You protected him against some potentially serious illnesses, and in so doing, you've also done the right thing by other children too. Mm, cool. Anyway, I thought while I was at the surgery I'd ask you about his weight. He doesn't seem to be putting it on as fast as I was expecting from the stuff I've read online. He's had a bit of a sniffle for the last couple of weeks, but that wouldn't have had too much impact, would it? Question 30. You hear part of an update meeting in which a hospital manager is briefing a group of senior nurses. Now read the question. So, what's next on the agenda? Uh, yes. This hospital's been chosen as the first in the region to try out a scheme that's worked really well in Canada. What we're aiming to do is provide all of our patients who smoke with addiction therapy, including talking therapies, replacement aids, and, where appropriate, medication. That's regardless of whether they're admitted because of a smoking-related disease or not. And we won't be giving them a choice about whether to embark on therapy in the way that we do at present. We've employed a new member of staff to oversee this process, and she'll also have an important patient liaison role. So, without further ado, let me introduce Lindsay Grant, who will tell you a bit more now about how this is going to impact on your teams on the wards. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer, A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You hear an endocrinologist called Dr. Martha Haywood giving a presentation about female athletes who experience the condition called hypothalamic amenorrhea, HA. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Good morning. My name's Martha Haywood. 
and I'm an endocrinologist specialising in infertility. My presentation today is about hypothalamic amenorrhea, or HA for short. This is a condition where a woman fails to menstruate, not because of identifiable organic causes, but mainly because of stress brought on by, for example, excessive physical activity. I'm particularly looking at anovulation in athletes, and I draw on my own experience with many patients, as well as on wider research. I've opted to focus on this condition because I feel it needs to be looked at by a range of medical specialists, not just endocrinologists, and also because it's becoming more widely investigated with new insights emerging all the time. I'll start by looking at the potential beginnings of the problem with young, school-age athletes. Approximately 25% of teenage female athletes develop amenorrhea, compared with 2-5% to of that age in the general population. It's common for school-age girls who do intense training on a regular basis either to fail to start menstruating in the first place or to cease menstruating once it's begun. The response of one of my patients, I'll call her Linda, is representative of the demographic. Linda is a national youth champion runner, aged 16, whose mother advised her to come to me. Linda told me that when her period stopped, she was blasé because it simply didn't occur to her to think about any future problems with fertility. Why would she? For her, not having periods is actually a blessing because she doesn't need to factor in monthly fall-off of race times. And it didn't cross her mind to delve into why it was happening and whether it was happening to any of her classmates and fellow athletes. But what about when women athletes want to conceive, usually from their mid-twenties onward? The findings of a recent report from the USA are telling it's about infertility amongst athletes, compared with the general population. The researchers found that about one in six women currently have difficulty conceiving a child. About 12% of infertile women are athletes, and this figure is growing, with more females pushing themselves to the limit doing what they call extreme sports, like long-distance running, cycling or swimming. The report mentioned that some women may be genetically more susceptible than others to developing HA, and I find it curious that this hasn't been explored in more detail. One area that's been the subject of interesting research over several years is amenorrhea in ballet dancers. Approximately 45% of ballet dancers have no periods. That's irrespective of age, and a lot of girls begin intense training early in their lives. The key here is that many ballerinas have extremely strict food regimens to attain what they regard as the optimum physique, and this, combined with rigorous training, leads to an exacerbation of HA, which is a very important dimension to the condition. Many think wrongly of dancing as a less demanding activity than, say, running, but in my own practice, I see many dancers pushing themselves just as hard in terms of training as for any other sports, including those you normally associate with exceptional demands. So what's the response of older women athletes when they find they have HA? One of my patients is a 36-year-old pole vaulter, I'll call her Stacy, who's been trying to conceive for five years. She admits to a real sense of anger at her failure to get pregnant and says that as an athlete, as she puts it, she's been able to ask anything of her body and it has always responded. So it's been all the more horrifying to find that in this case it won't do what she wants. She says she feels desperate to be like any other woman and have a child at will and say she finds it hard to comprehend that the athletic achievements which have given her so much pride are now blighting her life. So what about treatment? When a patient presents with amenorrhea, 
We first have to make sure there is not an anatomical or physiological abnormality that's the problem. Once we've excluded that and established the HA diagnosis, we may recommend medication to induce ovulation, such as Famara or Clomid, but these are best taken when the patient has already started addressing problems with their training routines, diet, and so forth. In other words, that they've recognised what the root cause of their anovulation is. In certain cases, we can recommend counselling, but this tends to be most valuable after conception, to contribute to a healthier pregnancy, breastfeeding, and general well-being. Extract 2 Questions 37 to 42. You hear an interview with a neurologist called Dr. Alan Lode, who's talking about developments in the treatment of spinal cord injuries. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. In this podcast, Dr. Alan Lode will be telling us about developments in the treatment of spinal cord injuries. Alan, an injury to the spinal cord is clearly a life-changing event for the patient. In your experience with quadriplegic patients, what would be the main priority for recovery? Well, spinal cord injury has been called the testosterone disease because four out of five spinal cord injuries happen to young men. So it's not surprising that for most of my quadriplegic patients, the ability to have normal reproductive functions are very high priority. In fact, it comes second after the ability to regain the use of their upper limbs. Bladder control comes third, but the use of the lower limbs comes way down the list because modern wheelchairs are pretty effective. So tell us a bit more about what's being done to help with bladder control. I believe there's something called the Brindley device that can help here? Yes, This is one solution that's been developed, but it's not without its disadvantages. So, the most common method of bladder control is still catheterization. This is quite a simple procedure, but it does carry a risk of UTIs, as well as scarring of the urethra. So quite a number of patients do now use the Brindley device. In its original form, this is an implant to which an external stimulator is applied manually, causing the bladder to contract and empty itself. The main snags that in order for it to be inserted, the sensory nerves from the pelvis into the spinal cord have to be severed. And this causes weakening of the pelvic muscles and loss of sexual function. So they're now working on a new version of the device which retains the sensory nerves and can actually read signals from them, allowing the patient to empty the bladder when necessary. So this adapted version of the Brindley device is basically a biorobotic device. That's right. It records signals from individual nerves. And apart from its use for bladder control, another possible application is for patients who have artificial limbs. Prosthetics are quite sophisticated now. An amputee may have a range of prosthetics for different purposes. And in fact, some can allow a user to outperform a non-amputee in a sport such as running or mountain climbing. 
But what still doesn't work very well is their interface with the nervous system. The technology needed for recording signals from nerves for a whole limb is very complicated. So researchers are now looking at the adapted Brindley device as a way of approaching the problem. And I understand that as well as on humans, research is also being done on dogs with spinal injuries. Yes. These injuries are surprisingly common among dogs. A trial was carried out a few years ago in which cells from the nasal cavity of injured dogs were transplanted into their spine, and this had the effect of restoring some movement. More recently, a similar procedure was carried out on a human patient in Poland, allowing a paralysed man to regain some mobility, which is very exciting news. Coming back to dogs, one simpler way of allowing them to move around is to support their back legs on a pair of wheels. They soon learn to manage these, but they tend to dribble urine as the wheels don't deal with the problem of bladder control. So a simplified version of the Brindley device has been trialled to deal with this problem. Coming back to spinal cord damage in humans, is it ever possible to get damaged nerves to reconnect? It's possible, but it's not easy. Spinal cord injury causes damage to both motor and sensory nerves. If either type's been severed, it has to be coaxed to regenerate across the site of the injury. The problem is that nerve fibres aren't very good at getting through scar tissue, so if this is built up at the site of the injury, getting those fibres to span even a small distance is tricky. Researchers have restored sensory nerve fibres in rats, but not in humans, and restoring motor nerve fibres is proving an even greater challenge. What improvements do you predict in the treatment of these injuries? I think we may see some dramatic improvements. At present, if a young child receives a spinal injury, their chances of recovery are relatively high. Their brains can adapt and allow fresh links to be made as they learn new skills. But as we mature, a cartilage-like coating wraps around the nerve fibres, cementing them in place and preventing them from making new connections. However, scientists have now discovered an enzyme called chondroitinase, which can dissolve this coating, and this could make rehabilitation much more successful. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.